So we're live. Hi, guys. Um, welcome to the show. Today we have a debate between Wheat Waffle and Jasmine. Alex can, couldn't make it tonight, so I'll be taking over for him. So before we start, can you guys give your opening statements and kind of introduce yourselves? Uh, sure. Do you want to go first or? Shit. Give me two seconds. Okay, I can uh, go first then. Uh, are we, are no, we just, just doing no, our... Seconds. No, it's are just because I was getting double our um, intros, or are we doing our opening statements on the topic? If you, you if you can start with your intro and opening statement. Okay, yeah. so Sorry. yeah, I was just silent okay. there because um, I realized that I was getting double and I had the stream open on another tab, so I just had to okay. pause it two seconds quickly. But I can go first, or if you want to go first, seems like you got something to say. Doesn't matter. I I, I guess I can go first. Um, so my name is Jasmine Jafar. Um, I am an OnlyFans creator. I'm also a licensed attorney. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I got to say about me. And then it seems like the topic that we're debating today is how much looks matter in dating. Um, and I guess I would say that it's hard to put an exact like percentage or exact amount. I do think they're important. Um, I think where me and, uh, wheat waffles disagree is how important they are. I think of course they matter, but things aren't black and white. There's a lot of nuance and complexity. I think especially when it comes to dating and mate selection, even evolutionary biologists, they have competing theories. It's not like a big consensus consensus in that world. Even a lot of the, like, I know David Buss is like a big one that a lot of red pillars mostly use. And like a lot of those theories, like alpha fucks, beta bunks, even he has gone back on a lot of that because there just hasn't been, um, compelling research to back those up. I think that what most of the research shows on physical attractiveness is that there's usually a threshold people want there, both men and women, it matters, and they want them to be somewhat attractive or attractive enough. And then those other qualities take over instead of like, so if someone's attractive enough to you, you'd rather have someone who's attractive enough, but also smart, kind, intelligent, whatever, versus someone who's super attractive, but doesn't have any of those qualities. I think one of the issues with, um, I've watched a few of Wheat Waffles videos is relying too much on online dating and swipes. When we see that in real life, a lot of those patterns don't align with what goes on in online dating. And basically the way that the most um, prevalent theories in psychology for online, I mean, for mating is assortative mating, the similarity attraction hypothesis, people tend to mate across attractiveness, IQ, values, and um, we tend to like people who we see around us, proximity, and those things are big indicators of how you date and who you will be with. So, yeah, I guess that's my main argument here. Perfect, Jackie. Yeah. Thank you so much for waffles. Uh, perfect. I'm just like writing the last couple points because uh, you said quite a lot there, and I want to just uh, be able to like respond to them one by one. I know it's the opening statement, but I think if we just get straight into the points of contention, then that will be uh, quite solid especially given the fact that I disagree with basically everything you said. Far and away, looks is the most important thing for guys in dating today, arguably more important for guys than it is for women. You mentioned it's like not black and white, and I guess I'd agree with that, but I say it's black, gray, and white instead. So the way I see it is that there's three tiers of men. You've got chads who, I guess, you know, are the going to the analogy of black, gray, and white would be white, that they get, are getting the most easier time in dating today. And they can get away with negative traits. That doesn't mean that positive traits will help them, but they can often get results and success, especially via online dating, using negative game or making mistakes, errors that a lot of dating coaches would pick up on. So their looks is so strong and powerful that it's often compensating for their negative qualities. And then you've got normies who are in the gray area and they can get some success. They are struggling really hard just because the monopoly that the top 10% of guys, the top 10% of chads is so strong. So the normies are getting breadcrumbs. So that's, but that's not to say that they can occasionally get a success if they put in some work. A lot of people say that red pill works for them because if they learn game, if they improve their social skills, if they climb the wealth ladder and things like that, they might actually have some results. And then lastly, you've got the black, which is the sub fives. And there's no 
real options for them besides taking some extreme measures such as moving abroad to Southeast Asia where dating would be a little bit easier or any country where the average height of the population is shorter, the average SMV is lower and they can potentially use their Western status to me make the women are more likely to be attracted to them because women associate western people with wealth and you know uh their, their smv is higher uh but in the west if you're a sub five there's basically no hope for you getting a legitimate relationship unless you beta box or some crap like that um the next thing that you mentioned was like the threshold theory i think that's somewhat true and once you meet a certain threshold that a woman will desire you and i've experienced a lot in my like tinder experiment that if a woman gives you choosing signals right off the bat if she compliments you on your appearance then that means that you pass the threshold and from there you can actually get the woman out on the date or whatever else provided you do things correctly that yes can turn into a no later on if you screw things up However, the main thing that I want to say on this point is that the threshold that most women have nowadays is so unbelievably high that they're pretty much only looking at the top 10% of men or, you know, maybe some normies if they have a niche press preference and have a certain type. Like, so they might go for a top 30% or a top 40% if they, if he has a niche quality and that's what they desire. But so, so I kind of agree with the threshold theory, but it's redundant for the majority of men just because they're not even close to meeting the threshold. Like you, I'm guessing you've often heard women say about they have a standard of six foot and above in terms of height. And the vast majority of men aren't close to six foot. So if you're a 5'10 guy, which is average, same as me, then a lot of women are going to reject you based, based on the fact that you're not six foot tall. So I think I've said a lot about, you know, my main point. So uh, yeah. If you want to respond to any of them, I'm more than happy. Yeah, so I guess my main issue with this is, is that why don't we see this reflected in real life with dating? So we don't see that, like, for instance, height. Um, I've looked at a bunch of studies. It seems like super, super tall men have on average like a, couple, a few extra partners, but that it's it's not like, oh, if you're tall, you have all these partners, 5'7 to 5'10, they don't see much of a difference. It's like only the super, and even then it's very minuscule. Um, things like the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, don't also seem to bear out in real life. Plus, a lot of times it's actually reversed too. If you were looking at the reverse, it looks like 20% of women get 80% of the men. But what it really is when you actually look deep into it, it's just that 20% of the population is more promiscuous and they're sleeping with each other more so than 20% of men are getting 80% of women. I think this is clearly indicated when you look at um, like the GSS surveys and stuff like Sexist was actually in 2022. It's gone down quite a bit. People with no sex between 18 and 30, it's like 12 to 15 percent on average. Um, 18 to and that's 18 to 24. The 18 to 24 range, men seem to have less sex. Um, 25 to 30, there's only 8% who said they haven't had sex with anyone in the past year. Vast majority, upwards of, I think, 85%, and it's almost like 90% for women, have only had sex with one person. Most people tend to have sex in relationships. Um, and I think it, this is also just like, you know, people, women will say, or women can put on an app that like, oh, I want six foot and above, but these are not the only people mating. I mean, we can just look around people who's, who are under six feet, have girlfriends, people tend, like I said, this is the most well-researched theory in the, uh, psychology of attraction is the assortative mating and the similarity attraction hypothesis that people tend to mate across, um, in, in a multitude of different fat on a multitude of different metrics. And so I guess my main issue is if this is the way that you're saying the world is, then how come we are not seeing that in the real world? How come we are not seeing that it's just really tall or just really attractive people that are able to find relationships and be together? How come between the ages 25 and 30 in 2022, only 8% of men had no sexual partners and the vast majority of men were with one person? Um, where, where are you getting this data from? Because I've heard completely different figures. That is the new GSS. Seen... Yeah, and actually here, I think I shall, we can put this. Okay, in... I'd be more than happy to see the screen share on this because yeah. the chart that I often reference is the it's basically a hockey stick, hockey stick chart. Yeah, where men are having less sex. There's more men that have not had sex in the last 
two years. It's either since they turned 18 or in the last two years. I can't remember exactly what it was. There might actually be two charts, but they both showed the same thing, that the percentage of men who were out of the dating market was only like 10% throughout the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. But as soon as Tinder, Instagram and all of that came along, then the results shot up and it went up to, I think, 27%. So you're looking, there was one 2018 uh, GSS survey that all the incels and the black pillars like used that wasn't replicated in 2019, 2020, 21. I just sent you, this is um, date psychology did a statistic, a statistician went through and you can see all those graphs. I think we can even share them on screen. Interestingly about Tinder, there was a 2022 study. It was a longitudinal study of 1.3 million college college students. um, And they found that the fraternity members uh, saw six percent increase in total sexual partners. The top twenty-five percent of men saw a sexual increase in partners by four point three percent. The average number of sexual partners in that top twenty-five of college students was two. So we're not seeing like, and, and I, I can like dating apps. A lot of times, a lot of people are just swiping, and then it's like nothing's happening. So I don't always think that dating apps are reflective of what goes on. I think it's one out of five people in in our age, in the, I think, 18 through 30 um, partners that say they met online. So to use online dating and go just by Tinder swipes, which is what a lot of the data I feel like in this sphere you guys use, and then to make generalizations about the general population, I don't think is borne out by the data. Well, based on the fact that online dating apps are becoming the main way and in fact already are the main way that people meet nowadays i think that it is a significant part and you can't just overlook at it and i'm not overlooking a lot of people do they just say like oh but you know tinder's not real life bro look at the real world bro and you know then they just refute any online metrics even though when you think about the average guy he doesn't have a social circle the average guy is basically his only options are online unless he wants to cold approach too and um you know when it comes to warm environments most guys don't even have a warm environment because the way that work is nowadays it's so segregated most men just work with a bunch of other men because if you're in any like computer field or mathematics engineering construction chances are you're just surrounded by men all day every day and same with women if they're in nursing or teaching they're surrounded by women all day every day so warm approach for the majority of people just isn't an option even when you look at sports every sport i've ever played has just been all men there's no sports out there unless i want to sign up for netball and something and you know be, be the creepy guy who hits on all of the women and deliberately signs up for netball just so he can approach women that's not an option if you play any real sport like rugby cricket football it's going to be all men so warm approach for most guys isn't an option everyone knows that 99 percent of guys just don't have a social i mean well even with online dating apps like there are far more men on there than women but even under 30 about half have used it 30 to 50 drops to 37 percent uh it's about 47 percent so you're right that people say it's the best way to meet people but it's still only 47 percent to say that and then like 23 percent say still like through friends so it's still under even though it's the most compared to other ways to do it it's still under half and it's about half of us they even use it and it's far less women that even use it so i think where you're right is we do have a loneliness epidemic i think seeing how men don't even have close friends they don't have a social circle um and this has been increasing throughout uh recent decades um with the with the onset of social media i think covid has made this far worse so i would love like even people like you instead of focusing on dating even to teach men to have friends to have social circles because that having a lot of friends especially having a lot of female friends is one of the best ways that you can be do well with women i don't think the best way to do well with women is to sit online and analyze your jawline and determine whether you're worthy or not it you know what i mean i, I and it you don't see men who like like i'm a lawyer in the lawyer world and law school, like men don't think like this. They're not walking around like, oh my God, in my, my jawline and this and that. There are underlying, and you find this, you find that the incel community does actually report less social support than other groups. It's not always just based on how they look. It's also based on they have overlapping mental health conditions, autism, and they're, they, I mean, they also have overlap with autism, but they also have high rates of depression, anxiety. They have less social support. All of those things also tie into it. 
Um, people also do tend to rate people. There's been studies that show that people do tend to rate people as more attractive when they do like their personalities. Now, again, I'm not saying attractiveness doesn't matter at all, but I don't think it's just like the top 20% of men. And then for the bottom 80% of men, it's over because that's just not what we're seeing, um, when we're looking at this data. And I, I sent you the, in the, in the private chat, um, the it's, not, it's not necessarily over for the bottom 80% or bottom 90%, but the dating game is harder than ever. And the chance as a man that you can date across and date your equivalent, you know, you, you might disagree on this point. And, you know, you think that um, assortative mating happens to some degree, which in, in, in the end, you might be able to make that case. But it's only once a woman has gone older and the data confirms this, that the average age of marriage nowadays is 30 mm -hmm. uh, for both men and women. It used to be 20. So mm -hmm. the way it was 50, 60 years ago is you would get married to your partner, but you'd both be 20 years old. The woman would be a virgin and you'd be on the same looks level. And she'd potentially even be more attractive because women reach their peak SMV pretty much as soon as they hit 18. And it stays that way until 25. And I think when I'm looking around and I'm judging the attractiveness of the average man and the average woman at 20 years old, there's a lot more sixes and sevens who are women than there are sixes and sevens who are guys. So if anything, you would probably be dating up back in, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago when you got handed your trad virgin wife. However, nowadays, it's just not the same thing. The women today are basically going with the top 10% of men all throughout their late teens and early 20s. And it's only once they realize that they can't secure the commitment of these top 10% guys, it takes 10 years of essentially getting blown out by um, these top 10% of chads. And then it's only once they come to that realization that they were never going to get that commitment, they end up having to settle for the beta normie who, you know, maybe he's got some money now or, you know, he, he'll be able to get her out of her mess and he'd basically be the knight in shining armor. So I, I think you're, you're, you're like, oh, people are getting married later and then you're just making up a reason for it. There are a multitude of reasons for that. One is just that people are less established early on, like a four-year college degree now is like a, was like a four-year high school degree. The average homeowner in this era you're talking about, the age, the, the first home buyer age was like in their 20s or almost 30. Now it's like 40 something. And so that's one of the reasons for the decline in sex too for younger people. But there's also been a decline in teen pregnancy. There's been a decline in drunk driving. There's just been a decline in crazy adolescent behavior because uh, I, I can give you an example. Lawyers, none of, no female lawyer really gets married before we finish graduating. We work for a few years. It's very normal now to get married in your early thirties, not because you, oh my God, I can't find anybody now. And I was getting blown out by chads before. That's not the, necessarily the reason. The reason is also because we're getting careers and we're being established in those careers before we're going to settle down and have a kid versus back in those days where women didn't weren't even able to enter the workforce. So like in 18, 19, 20, they were like, OK, I guess I'm going to get married and pop out children. That's just not the reality of the world today with women being able to enter the workforce and just how harder it is for younger people to become established. And just our views on marriage and stuff have changed, too. A lot of people don't view it the same way. Some people don't even even want to get married. That's why I'm not just looking at marriage rates. I'm looking at just partners in general too. Um, and so I think that it's cool that you can just put on an explanation as to why you're seeing a trend, but unless you have some data to back that up, it's just speculation. I think hookup culture is more rife than it ever has been at any other point in history. And where are you getting Women that? Okay. There was a I can't remember what study it was from, but the data basically showed that six, two thirds of men in 18 to 29 year old age range identify as single, whereas only a third of women do. And what that implies to me, and I, you know, you can you can check the data, and the it's it's not countered by an the the reverse imbalance of men who are less likely to be single in their 30s and 40s so that that's not the explanation which means leads me to think that the only reason for why way more women identify as being in a relationship than men from 18 to 29 is because there's chads who are spinning plates and 
the women think that the child is in a relationship with them, but the chads just see those women as plates. Does uh, that make sense? Well, so yeah. the women think that they're having a relationship with this chad, but in reality, he's just, you know, having them as a plate and using them for fun times. And that's why when the women are asked, are you in a relationship? They're saying like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm in a relationship. I only have sex in a relationship. I, I'm not, you know, dirty like that. I, I, I would never have sex outside of a relationship. They're allowed to use that justification. However, in reality, they are just still indulging in hookup culture, but they don't even realize it because the Chad is still sleeping with them and he knows that they're a plate, but he might keep them, keep that intention uh, with, withheld because he, he wants to keep them as, as a plate. So that's one explanation. The other explanation, which is far more likely, is that women tend on average to date three to five years older than them. So if it's you're not, no, because I could show you the data and you don't see a reverse uh, percentage in older age well, groups. No, you but do, what I mean, is what you like would need to do is you need to look at women 18 through 29, and you probably need to look at men 18 through, because th the women that are 26, 27, 28, 29, when I was 26, 27, 28, 29, all my boyfriends were older than me. So if you, if you looked at that, it would look like I am in a relationship and you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be asking them if they're in a relationship because they're outside of the age range you're looking at. Another thing is right now I'm looking at the GSS survey. This is the same survey that a lot of you guys use in 2018 to do the 27%. I'm looking right here. Um, zero, uh, for people who reported zero partners, 14.92% men, 13% women, one partner, 62.3% uh, men, 66% of women just had one partner, two partners, 6.29% men, 8% women, three partners, 11.94% men, 3% women, 11 to 20 partners is less than 1% for both. So hookup culture is not really, it's like this idea that we have, and this is pretty well researched that we, it's like one of those things where, you know, when you're in high school, you're like, oh, everyone's drinking, everyone's doing drugs, but then the data comes out and it's not everybody or oh, everyone's having sex. We tend to overestimate how much other people are having sex. But when you look at this data, it's just not shown. It's not shown by Pew. It's not shown by the GSS surveys. Um, and if you look at what sex in a committed relationship in 2022, 18 to 24 range, you see it. And then 25 to 30, 89% of men say uh, yes, 92% of women. So in general, people are not engaged. It's very, it's those outliers that are having sex with all these people. And it seems to be the same percentage of men and women. So again, I just don't see what you're talking about in real life. I think in date on dating apps, if you're just looking at swiping, maybe, but that's not what we're seeing in real life when it comes to how people form relationships. Okay, there was a lot of data you said there. I don't actually know where you got any I of that. I sent you the link in the and... private chat. Okay, that was where you, you was reading the same data from all of that. It was just a little bit confusing because there was, like a, there was like a hundred different numbers thrown out there and it was just a little bit difficult to follow along. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll stick with the data that I've got because um, this is from Pew Research, you know, which I'm guessing is. Can a... you send me that too? So I can, because well, I, I was about you... to share my screen. So, okay. Um, well, can you send it also it in the chat and then I can look at it? Okay. Can you also, yeah. so I can share with the chat as well, please? Well, if I'm sharing the screen, surely it would come up. Two seconds. Okay. Are you able to see it now? If you're looking on a uh, Streamlabs, you should be able to see it. Yeah, I just have my notes in this, so it'd be easier if you send it in the chat. But if you don't want, like, I just want to know the link so I can look at it um, instead well, of just, just going. Can you I've, send I've just... the link in the chat? Because okay, I, I have it really small on my screen because I have my notes open and I, I'm only on my laptop. I don't have two screens. Okay. Oh, I'll just get it because I closed the tab. Um, I'll have to or you can just tell me what to Google if I'm um, trying to just look up I've new research. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Well, it's not from the official, uh, it's an article, but it's got the same data. So you should be able to trace back to it anyway, to the original uh, pu publishment. But what I just sent you in the chat was an article with the data. Okay. I'm also looking at Pew Research that came out in February of 
two, three about date online dating. And I think these graphs also kind of show what I'm saying. So maybe I can share these after. Okay. Well, have you seen the link that I put in the chat? Have you been able to open that one up? Okay. Yes, finally. Okay, cool. Yeah. So as you can see, when you look at the number of single men from 18 to 29, it's almost two thirds. And for women, it's only one third. And now that trend continues from 30 to 49, albeit the gap is a little bit less. The gap is basically non-existent from 50 to 64, and it only reverses by 65 plus. So your argument that, oh, 27-year-old women, they're dating 32-year-old men. So that's why the uh, you know trend is like that for 18 to 29-year-olds. So it's just, it's just simply not the case. I think the reason but you wouldn't know that unless you wouldn't know that because you're still measuring men and women for each of those in the same age. Now, I think there could be a little bit of what you're talking about, but I don't think that's the whole story. And I and again, I think that if you're right, then like I uh, if if uh, I don't know how to share my screen, if the moderator wants to throw up my the GSS survey, the one that I shared, you can see, you wouldn't see. And it's not just that any survey where they're looking at in like in, in the past couple of years, when they're looking at uh, uh, how many partners people have had, it's not showing that this top percentage of men is having way more partners. It's showing that the vast majority of people are having one partner. Sexlessness has also gone down um, in the past, uh, in 2022 than in 2021, 2019 pandemic year so why is that trend happening in your uh, opinion yeah do, go do down you know, do you know what i th find interesting about you is that you see? like to you like, like go to up, bounce. Go up. you can see that well this is 18 through 24 but up there was the 18 through if you go to the top it was yeah this is all e each cohort but the 18 the very top one was just 18 through uh 35 i believe you can see the distribution of sexual partners um and this is from the general social survey. So I, and you can find other ones that show the same thing. You can read this. They, they talk about how these trends seem to be the same ones that we're finding okay, on other and, surveys. And this is based off of, um, you know, verbal, well, or even written uh, data and, and results. What it doesn't show. And, and I know that there's definitely uh, elements of this, which is why trying to collect data from people's answers and opinions is, is never a good idea because people lie. And the way that men and women lie is going to be working in opposite directions. So men are always going to seem like they are having more sex than they actually are. And women are going to be seeming like they have less. Then so if that's the case, then why do such few men report having a lot of sex? Most people report having zero to two partners on average. I think so. If if you're right, then guys should be saying they've had five. So according to that data, it says that zero, the number of men and women that have zero partners was I think fifteen percent of men and about fourteen percent of women. And I'm guessing that was in that was that in the last year or the last two years. That was uh, let's see. I, I'm pretty sure since it's 2022, I'm assuming they asked about 2022, but the same thing was shown kind of in 2021. The one year that it was a little different that you guys ran with was 2018 because 2018 showed a big difference between men and women. It seemed like men were having way less sex than women were. And that wasn't replicated in any year before or after, which is why replication is also really important in science and data. Um, if you're going to just say people all lie about this stuff year after year after year after year, even when the lies don't even necessarily showcase what you're saying they would showcase, well, then why aren't they lying in your random one chart that you show that doesn't... Well, I, th I think that they would be lying and it would be consistent. But could you take any guesses of why men would be more inclined to lie? And and would how, how, would, how would you think that they twist their answer to make it seem like they have either had a partner or more partners than they truly have. And the then fact the that the over women. half of them report one shows that they're not trying to pretend that they're all having sex with a bunch of people. It's been su it's such a low percentage of people who even have sex with more than five, both men or women. So I, I don't, it's not showing that men are saying they are having sex with, unless you're saying that everyone's lying to go from zero to one, but then you can't also use da other data that shows that, oh, all these men are having no sex and believe that one. But then when it doesn't show what you want, then assume everybody's lying. It, 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 that's not hmm. how to be 
I think that's an intellectually lazy way to look at things. Yeah, I, I understand what you're talking about, but it doesn't seem that this data is replicable either because your data, you know, it just seems a bit mir miraculous that in 2018 or whenever the previous chart was made, that well, there was 2019, there was 2020, 2021. Yeah, and then and, and then all of it, those showed the same thing. Is it, it's been showing this trend, and it's shown the sexlessness has actually decreased. A lot of people are saying because COVID is. Are you less sure about that? Because according to the previous chart, it looks like a hockey stick, and it just seems uh, a little bit miraculous. Okay, I can actually pull up nose dive after yeah, that, especially when you right look here. at the circumstance of the dating market and how. Well, it's here's the year before. Here's 2021. I'm going to share it in now. the chat. I'm going to share 2021 in the chat. Well, can you can, can you set, can you send a chart which shows shows the overall trend because that's the chart that I'm used to. The overall trend in in well, I'm showing you year by year what people are reporting, and it's and yeah, but I don't want to see a year by year. I want to see the yearly trend, which is evident in in this chart, which I'll bring up on uh, my screen if I'm able okay, to share. Can it you again. also share all your sources instead of just throwing a chart out there so I can look at it? Well, you've seen this chart before, and it's from the exact same data that you've been speaking of, but the GSS. So, you know, if, I don't think I need to show a source for this. Based well, on the fact no, that I, I, whatever you're looking at, because I can't, your screen is super small for me. I think it would be helpful, like, just like I'm sharing my sources, if you could share yours. I'm not saying that your sources are incorrect, although you're saying that for some reason the 2022 data is incorrect, but GSS is right in, in this. Yeah, this has been a big one that people, this was 2018. So you're looking yeah, I know at it's 2018. So according to the GSS, in like, 2018. we've got this upwards trajectory. And then in 2022 or 2023, where, whenever that recent data was, we see a drop in the data, which is, you know, somewhere around here, somewhere around well, the 15% mark. Which is Which why so many me looks like an anomaly because why would it be going across, across, across? Tinder is introduced, Instagram happens, the dating market essentially gets monopoly monopolized by the top 10% of chads, and then it skyrockets. All of this makes sense up to this point. Why would it suddenly turn around and drop in 2022? It, no, it's not 2022, it's 2019, 2020, 2021. And that chart has actually not been like so that tinder the thing you guys added that was not in the gss one and the gss one yeah, i know it's not in the gss no the one. real gss one doesn't actually look like that so this has been debunked too yes, that's it why does. It's, it's, yes no that's what i'm telling you it doesn't and so if you're gonna even if you wanted to look at this and say this is the way it is after 2018 apparently something changed because 2019 2020 2021 and even like most of the trends for, uh, before that did not show this. So unless you're saying that there is some conspiracy theory or something happened after this year, because 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022, especially uh, after COVID, the sexlessness has dropped for both for both people. And I, there was that 2022 study I also, um, and if you want to know the author, it's Berkerin et al., which was 1.3 million college students. This was a 2022 study that shows that actually Tinder and all this stuff has only led to a nominal increase of sexual partners for your quote unquote chats on average, like about two. Um, so again, I, I feel like you, you, you guys, your community likes like when you find one part of a big trend and you're like, oh, look at this, this is the thing. But then you don't look at all the data, which is why if you actually are more educated, um, you you would know how to look at data and not just take something and run with it. Because a lot of researchers have spent time explaining how what you the, the thing you guys ran with was not the whole picture. And I just sent you, for instance, once from the 2022 that doesn't show this in 2021. I also can link in the chat doesn't show this. Um, so well, could you here... provide an explanation, though? Could you provide an explanation? Because as far as my knowledge goes, the dating market has been monopolized by the top 10 percent of chats. And what I find interesting about but you, it hasn't that you been. Liked... Can, can you stop interrupting me, please? Um, I, 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 what I find interesting about you is how you like to bounce from talking about the real world to talking about data. And when it suits you, you, you like to talk about data. And when it opposes you, then you like to start talking about the real world. Well, when I look at the real world, which is you know what you constantly keep uh, talking about or ignoring when it doesn't work with you, is that the men that I see who are getting with the most women and the guys that potentially are in relationships or leading uh, women on and are looking to bring more women into their life, aka monopolizing, are these high value men who are in the top 10%. It's the bottom 20% guys, like the guys 
who I know before I even get to know their name. I just take one look at them. I look at their height. I look at their face and I'm like, okay, I can tell that he's got absolutely no, nothing to write home about in his dating life. That's who I see in the real world. And it completely mirrors what I'm seeing in, in this data on the screen as well, that if you're in the bottom 20% of men, your dating life basically sucks. And if you're in the top 10% of men, provided you put in the time and effort and, you know, uh, generating leads and bringing women into your life, then you can so easily be a monopolizer, but it requires you to have those looks and height to begin with. So what, this is what I'm trying to tell you when I'm not using data in real world is different. My data actually, it, my real world, uh, it, actually is like the data. I'm not using data in real world. Talk about my anecdotal experience. I've never talked about my anecdotal experience. You're the one bringing up your anecdotal experience. Anecdotal experience does not trump statistical data. And what I'm trying to tell you is this 80, 20, this Pareto principle has been debunked, right? Cause it, what it's showing How can is you say it's been debunked. Because when you reverse it, it also shows that 20% of women are getting 80% of men. So what statisticians have concluded is that 20, it's about 20% of people that are slightly, whatever, more promiscuous. And it's probably even less actually when, from what I've read, they've actually concluded. And then everybody else is pretty much having sex in relationships. And then it seems like 18 through 24 year old men are having less sex than previous decades, but also because we're getting married later all kind of juvenile uh, risky behavior has gone down for that group. 25 to 30, there's actually very few men that are virgins. And this has been replicated by Pew Research and GSS. And I can share those links, but apparently you don't like those links. You think they're all lying. You like your two graphs. Um, and so, so that's my point is that it's not as dire as the way you're making it. And yes, obviously you can always find a lot of people that fall into it, even if it's 5% of men. And I would say maybe there's 5% of men that have a really tough time. That's still millions and millions of people who look at this kind of content and they're like, yeah, yeah, this is, what are the three ends of radicalization need narrative network? And I'm not saying you are, are, are radicalizing anybody because I haven't seen anything like that. But my introduction actually to this world was in law school when I learned about incels and I went into their forums and I know all of the stuff you guys say. And then you would see the more extreme, the ER, Elliot Roth, like you would see that side of it too. But again, you, you know, you, you, you learn and also through research and, and research have confirmed this, that those groups also tend to have less friends. They do tend to have higher rates of autism. They do tend to have higher rates of mental health and physical health issues. And that of course is going to affect them. I do think you can even argue that the bottom 10%, there's a 10% that are undesirable for men. I completely agree with that. And that 10% is far, their circumstance is far more dire than the bottom 10% of women. I completely agree with that. But the vast majority of people do not fall into this black pilled in cell subhuman world that you're talking about. And in general, people are mating and they're mating typically people they work with people they're around. Like I'm a lawyer. Lawyers tend to marry other lawyers more than they marry any other profession. People tend to marry people in their own profession. The most people tend to marry across IQ, across values, across religion. Those are the things that, that people and that's not me. Assortative mating is a very well-researched theory and so similarity attraction hypothesis is the most well-researched theory in the attraction and the psychology of attraction. So your beta bucks, alpha fucks theory also is not borne out. David Buss is the one who actually first talked about it. And then he took it back recently. He's like, there's just not enough data to actually show this. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just don't think that even cherry picking a few data points here and there to be like, look, what I'm saying is true. It, it's not. Yeah. I, I think there are plenty of men who are spending time on these apps and they're swiping and they're swiping and they have no friends. They have no whatever. And they're like, this sucks. I agree. Those people do exist, but to pretend that that's happening on a grand scale is not, it's, it, it showcases a lack of critical thinking skills. It's something that human beings like to do. They like to turn everything black and white. They like to go, this is the way things are. And there's no nuance. There's no anything else in between. This is it black pill end of the world. And this is why I'm such a big advocate of education and stuff, because those ed being educated and those kinds of things teach you how to not think like that. Critical thinking is something that needs to be taught. It's not something human beings are naturally good at. Okay. No, no one in the black pill community is saying that it's the end of the world. All we're saying Isn't that what is black pill means? These, 
No, of course not. The black well, pill. Well, it means it's me. like doomed, right? It's not like red pill. No, is no, 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 no. And that actually like makes me question all, all of the things that you've said so far. The fact that you've not even understood what the black pill means, because I've said that mo this multiple times in uh, my videos, that it stands for three things. And none of them are saying, oh, just give up, bro. Like, there's no hope, bro, and all of this stuff. The black pill is saying three things. That women want to date up in terms of um, SMV. They want to date up. They want to date a man who is better looking than them. They want to date a man who is wealthier than them, who's higher status, everything like that. So that's all encompassed in the first pillar of hypergamy. The second pillar is the importance of looks which is that when it comes to hypergamy, when women want to date a man who is more attractive than them. So we're talking about height, physique, and face. And the third pillar is the importance of genetics. So when it comes to that second pillar of looks, it's not as much about having just having the nice haircut, bro, and just groom properly, bro, just wear nice clothes, bro. No, it's more about how attractive is your face, how strong is your jawline, how attractive is your eye area do you have a good hairline are you tall so it's a lot more of the genetic factors of your appearance none of that none of those three pillars have anything to do with giving up or believing that i mean i went on your it. youtube channel right now your top video just says dating is over and it says like you that is like the gloom and doom of your your chance that is the number one video on your thing it says dating is over you're saying that's, that's right not okay so so you're taking a thumbnail which I have intentionally designed to give an exaggerated depiction, which is how YouTube has always uh, worked, that people know that you will clickbait the thumbnail and exaggerate in the thumbnail. And then once you actually watch the content, it's a lot more grounded and based on evidence and facts. So I don't believe that dating is over unless maybe you're in the top, the bottom 10% of men or bottom 20% of guys. And there's no, no way that you can look max to say like the middle 50% or above. Uh, the the online, like even I just looked up black pill definition. So maybe yours is different and you're completely different than your thumbnails. Your thumbnails have no, I did actually watch that video and you do say all these truths about how basically dating is very dire. And it's like the difference I would say between you and the red pill is that red pillars think that there is more self-improvement that you can do to change your circumstances. Whereas the black pill, thinks that like, you know, if your jawline is fucked, then you're like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't see, and I, I watch some of your videos. I don't see much. Most of your content is like, this is the way things are instead of like, you know, I've been debating a lot of red pillars, fresh and fit in them. They kind of say, this is what you need to do. This is how you can improve versus you're getting paid to tell men what their face oh, no. is. That, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not the case at all. So pretty much every video on my channel, I have some solution involved. In fact, I even have a video on my channel, um, which breaks down a flow chart saying, here's what you should do, no matter what your circumstance. And every single guy has a path to follow in order to get the most out of their dating life. And if that means taking an extreme solution, such as going to a easier dating market, then so be it. There's, there's no evidence on my channel to suggest that I'm here just to pander to a bunch of guys who are lazy and don't want to put in the work. No, I've always been. I mean, I can only speak on the ones I saw. Life. A lot of the ones I saw, maybe I didn't click on the self improvement. Oh my God. I can't believe but that you. you I mean, your second most, your, your third most part, it says, How to know when it's truly over. Are you sub five, normie, or like, Okay. I mean, if you're saying, I'm very glad then if you're not doing a, and, and, and I, and I did make sure to separate you from like the more violent extreme sect of the black pill incel world that, you know, the mass shooter side, like I'm not calling you that by any means, but I, I we don't need to harp on this point. My, I guess my main point of contention is that I don't think dating is as dire as you're claiming it to be. I do think there are issues. I don't think everyone has the same. I don't think life is fair. Yeah. If your IQ is low, lower, you may have to work harder in school. If you're not as attractive, you're not going to have as much of an easy time in dating, of course. But I don't see this, oh, the top percent of men are fucking all the girls and then all the, the, the most men in the middle or even 50% or whoever are having no sex or they can't find women. Like the percentage of men who didn't have any partners between 25 and 30 was 
is like 8%. And that's still bad. I, I, I don't, I don't want that for anybody, but they also seem to not have friends. They seem to, there, there just seems to be a loneliness epidemic going on. And I think with our world being more online and social media has had some dire consequences. I just actually look at general overall trends from what I'm seeing in the data and it doesn't show what you're talking about. And then if we're going to use anecdotal evidence, I don't see that in the world either, especially in more educated spheres. No one, none of them even like when I talk about like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is like insane to them. So there's a lot of stuff going on, I think, in this the, sphere of the internet. I don't know. An anecdotally for me, ev every circumstance that I see where there's like men interacting with women in the dating world, everything traces back to a black pill answer for why that's happens it's almost comical how often it, i see it play out so just to give a couple examples when i see a good looking guy who is leading on a bunch of women or like spinning plates or just pumping and dumping a bunch of girls then the girls are always significantly below his SMV. This will be like some six foot two guy who's good looking in the face. And he, you know, does a lot of approaches. He's on all of the dating apps. He has a good profile and everything like that. And he's able to match with and consistently arrange dates and essentially meet women who are fives, occasionally fours, sometimes sixes. And he can just go with them for a one night thing. It's so easy and routine. And he will just take them on a date. And then um, it, it, it's almost handed on a plate for him because the women leads the first day and he can easily just get the job done. And it's that simple on the first date. And it's difficult for him to necessarily get the top tier of women, but that's why he's more than happy to just spin plates and date short term casually with women that are two or three points below him and then as for the guys who are like fives and sixes when i see them get with women it's usually one of two things it's either the woman is significantly below his looks match and he has evidently dated down to a woman who he is higher value than but it's just purely out of desperation and it can work out in that sense or if he is dating across there's almost always something to balance the the seesaw it's either that she is having all of the power in the relationship and he's basically sucking up to her uh, every beck and call he's paying in one way or another either directly or indirectly that there's some financial mismanagement in the relationship and that's balancing it out. It's, it's a whole host of these reasons, but every single relationship and dating interaction I see, it always leads back to the black pill. Like, I've not so, seen an so, exception in the last two years. That's really cute for you and your anecdote. So my anecdote shows something completely different. Plus there's something called the frequency illusion in psychology, where it's like, once you believe something and you're looking for it, you're going to see more and more of it. I'm just going to say right now, normal people, normies or whatever you want to call us, we don't walk around and go 6.5, 8.2, 2.6. So. Like it doesn't work like that. I've seen plenty of women who are with men that are far less attractive. I've seen plenty of women who are met with men far more attractive. I see this a lot, especially in more educated spheres where people tend to date because they're working in the same thing and they're looking more for intelligence and income and stuff like that instead of your jawline. Like this fear of the internet, like if you're even walking around looking at people and going on a numerical scale to the 8.6 and like, I'm going to tell you right now, I could meet a really cool guy, but this would probably never happen. And if I, he's like pulling up his YouTube and he's looking at this kind of shit, oh, I'm out the door. And many women feel this way. If you're looking online, looking at your jawline, all of this, you probably have other issues that make you do that. Because I know a ton of very unattractive guys, overweight guys. Also, when you look at BMI, that you don't see any difference between men that are fat, have how many partners they have with how many partners people have when they're not fat. Height has a very nominal difference. I can also show up, pull up all of these. I can send them to you. These are also well researched and well replicated. So again, I would my hypothesis here, and I don't like to just say this is the way it is unless I have actual data to back this. Unlike you, I would say that the re the people that are online measuring their jaws yeah, you're probably screwed because if you're there doing that, then 
you're already there. Like I have somebody actually here who's helping me film stuff and he's not attractive and he's overweight. And he like, he's like, he, he gets people, he gets, still gets women. Cause he's funny. He's charismatic. And he, none of them have ever been like, I let me go look at my face ratio. Once you're at that point, you're probably, there are other confounding factors that got you there other than just the way you look. That's not to say there aren't some people that are very, very unattractive and that they don't face a harder time than men that are super, super attractive. But there's a reason that this is kind of just funny to a lot of normal people, well, men and women who look normal, who are not chads, who are not whatever, who are maybe a little overweight, who have a receding jawline that are still fine, that are married, that have kids, that have girlfriends. And they're like, what the fuck is this world? Like, Well, I've, I've been so adamant on the points that I've been talking about on my channel that I've actually went to the length of collecting my own data. And in fact, I actually uploaded a video today. Um, I'll just share it. And on how screen. did you get your sample size? How did you, cause I don't think you know a selection. So what I basically did is, is, is um, the, I, it was like a one to 10 rating video where guys would send their photos in. And then I would go to the university to ask actual women what their opinion is. And, the whole video was basically just a black pill because the guys who sent in their photos, even before they sent in, before before I even got the results, I knew what sort of ratings they would get. And I actually felt bad for this guy because as soon as he sent his photo, I knew that he was going to get terrible results. And that's exactly what happened in the video. Every single woman rated him a sub five. And I think his average ended up being like a 1.6 or a 1.5, something like that. Like, you know, this guy got ones and twos let alone being average, friend zoneable, whatever, let alone getting dates or being called hot and perfect. Yeah. Never in a million years, if this guy approached, like, it gets to a point where if you're so unattractive as a guy, that if you approach women, then you get labeled creepy and ugly. And, you know, women get offended by your approach. It's only like once you're at least average, you might get soft rejections and, you know, women might find it sincere that you've approached them, but it's only once you reach Chad level that you're going to be getting consistent results from it. Yeah, I actually went on your thing and I was, we were, me and my friend were trying to figure out your methodology for rating. And it seems like in, in two, you're like, I just intuitively, and then to check your biases, you pretend you're a woman swiping on Tinder. Again, I know, I don't know what your education level is, but this is not what's considered an actual study. Um, definitely. And I, again, I, I feel like if what you're saying is true, then this is what we would see reflected in the world. I'm not saying that people who are really unattractive don't have a harder time, but for the vast majority of people, those other things, having a lot of friends, having a lot of female friends, I think is a really great way that we, a lot of those guys don't struggle with women. Um, by the time you're sending in your picture to be looked at and you're going and you're, and, and also what people rate and what people do is different, right? So on dating apps, like women will say six feet tall or and I'm not doing it, but in real life, a lot of women, there's not six feet tall. It's only what percentage, like under 10% of men that are six feet tall. And it's not under 10% of men that have girlfriends or are having sex, right? Even the study that they show where most women were rating men less attractive and most men were rating women more attractive, which I saw you mention in one of your videos on dating apps, that same study also showed that men actually would only message the woman they found highly attractive though. And women were more likely to message the men they found attractive. Also that women were spending 50% more time on dating profiles, actually reading what the men were saying. I again, it's when you're forced to just rate somebody based. Okay. I can give you an example. I don't use dating apps. And the reason for that is I have no choice but to narrow by attractiveness because uh, everyone swipes on me. So my, I, I can't talk to 200 people, but the only thing that I have to narrow people down by is superficial. And I know in real life, all of the men I've dated, I wouldn't have swiped on their Tinder profiles and I wouldn't have swiped on there because I didn't find them super duper duper attractive. But once I actually met them, I see their demeanor. I see how they talk, making a woman laugh. I, I you know, I'm educated. I like guys who are smart. I, those are the things that really get me. But if I look at every guy's profile and I go, if he was also smart, if he was also funny, would I like him? Yeah. And that, now I'm, and now I'm swiping on 50% of people. I don't have the time to talk to that many people. So I don't use it. And that's one of the reasons women typically are on it. One third, I think it's like a five to one ratio on some, it's a three to one ratio on some women are using these apps far less than men, even though according to you, they have the advantage. It's because 
we don't have anything to go off of because we are more selective. So we're, so a lot more men are going to swipe, like pretty much everyone I want to swipe on me swipes on me. And then I'm just overwhelmed and I just get the fuck off. And a lot of women are like that because we have no choice, but to select based on superficial criteria. When in real life, we would look at a more overall picture. Well, that's just not the case. Cause even in real life examples, it's, it just always points back to the black pill. Like, and, and I think one of the most interesting scenarios that you can see as a man is when there's a one-on-one -on -one situation. So there's two guys competing over the same girl. And I've seen this scenario play out before. And it's just hilarious that there was one guy who was friends with this girl and Evidently, he was like in the friend zone and the girl wasn't that interested in him. The guy was about a 4.5, maybe 5. He was below average height and he was just some skinny guy, like, you know, nothing special to bring to the table. And the girl was about 6, maybe. And then the other guy who was competing with the uh, less desirable guy who was in the friend zone, he was a 7 overall SMV. And she had never seen this guy before. But by the end of the night, she ended up going home with the 7 out of 10 better looking guy. And I saw it a mile off as well. It was so obvious that it was going to happen. And you could just yeah. see the less attractive guy fade into the background and kind of admit defeat because he knew that he, he was getting mocked significantly by the higher SMV guy. It, it was just so blatant. And whenever I see scenarios like that, like I'm not even baffled by it by it because i just see it a mile off like ev yeah, every well, you're, scenario you're, i see you're also looking like you're looking for it you're 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 looking at people and going 4.5 no normal person does that. i'm sorry to tell you and we're a world of six billion people there are 330 million people in my country alone i can give you an example for everything anything you can possibly okay. find that's why i don't like to look at right, the pause two seconds then can you right can, can i um i'm not sure if my screen actually came up on the uh screen last time so waffles you, uh Someone from the chat asked me, sorry to interrupt, um, can you ask with Waffles to explain Pete Davidson being able to date women more attractive and more successful than him, even though he has a below average face? Well, because he's got loads of money and status. That's quite obvious. Once again, it well, points I to mean, the black like, pill. He's dating and women he's really who tall. have more money than him. Like Adriana Grande, it's way more successful than him. Yeah. He's the same with how, like, you know, Jake Paul, who's like, you know, maybe six out of 10 facially, is dating some eight out of 10 stunner. It's because he's got loads of YouTube clout and status. Okay, if he just, was, if he was some I, nobody, I, for the audience, think back to your high school, college. We all know the Pete Davidson of our high school or college. We all know that one guy that wasn't that attractive that still got the bitches because no he way. Had no I, way. I, 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 <laughs> That's never happened. Every guy in high school who got women that I saw. They were always tall. They were always had a good physique. And yeah, they okay, had so a good we just place. have different sort of ugly guy. So I'll leave it up to the audience because I think most of the audience, the ones who aren't going around, they're I mean, not You might have your audience. subjective opinion. but like, I've, 3. No, but I've, not... I've rated over, right, let me tell you, I've rated over 10,000 guys and I know like to a T how attractive guys are and whether they're going to struggle uh, in dating or not. And in fact, I get these points all of the time from people like you who say like, oh, but I know this one guy, he was a sub five and he I was didn't, still I, don't, I don't use those. And then, you started doing that. I don't do that. They, I yeah. One yeah, guy. Yeah, but you I just brought up that now. example about how you had that high school guy who, you know, you I thought was really unattractive. I just did that now. I didn't do that any other time. Yeah, I know. No, but I think this is why it's always flawed. Because whenever I look at them, and then I say, okay, he's not hes not actually a sub five. You just had your own subjective bias creeping in there. Because I look at the face as a whole and I know what women are like. I know what women desire, what features they go for in a man. So and do you, are, you just have these superpowers? Did you get a degree in this or did you just have an instinctual Well, I've ability been doing it for three years. Woman? So I've studied this. I know what huh. features women are looking for in guys and i can tell it's, it's like i don't think there's been any, any exceptions in this video that i uploaded all of the guys who sent their photos in i knew what kind of results they would get um before i even got the data i knew what remarks they would make like if there was some bald guy who sent in this photo i could tell straight away that all of the women would be like oh they're gonna rate him low because he's bald or same with an old guy as soon as an old guy sends in his photo, I'm like, okay, I know he's going to get mostly threes and fours because he's old. It always happens. Like, and when, when there's an attractive guy, I know he's going to get good ratings. Like this guy, 
I'm, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this example earlier, but I'm not sure if the image was on the screen. I knew he was going to get terrible results just by yeah, looking okay. at his face. I, I, I can tell that five too. It's not, it's not, especially if you're going just off physical attractiveness. You send me that photo or this guy's photo. I already know these guys. I don't mean it to be assholes. Uh, these guys look creep. Like they look weak. Like they don't even look like they're sane. Like even these sending in these kind of photos to like, I would never touch a guy who sends in photos to you to rate them. Like that activity on its own is unattractive to women by default. But there's been tons of studies. But that's that not what the women were saying though, was it? We women weren't saying like, oh, I'm rating every single guy a one because he sent in this photo. A lot of the women rated sevens and eights. Obviously they didn't come in a huge amount, but they did. So the point you made there is completely and, redundant. And, and just going and interviewing what, even 200 people, that's not, that's not a scientific study, right? And so my question, my main question to you is how come when we're seeing in real life is not the same thing? Even if you rate people oh, just on, on physical this attraction, is, this, this is what people always let's do. Say, they they just stop moving no, no, the no. Let me finish. Let me finish. You asked me not to interrupt you. Even if I were to concede that you have, you are just so good at looking at everyone's jawline and structure and you just know what everyone looks like and your opinion of physical attractiveness is correct, it still doesn't show that the people who are normal or unless they're in the very, very bottom, I am not seeing that they're unable to get dates or they are unable to have have women or they are unable to have families and kids and lead really happy, fulfilled lives. That's just not what we're seeing. Again, I think the, the crux of this debate is how much does physical attractiveness matter? And great, you, you are a connoisseur of determining physical attractiveness. You were born with this superpower. That's amazing. But it still doesn't mean that those things are that important because you're going around asking people to rate them. If you were to ask a lot of people, oh, can I see your significant other? A lot of other people are dating people typically in their same, uh, and those relationships actually last the longest. If you date somebody or you mate with somebody who's around your same level of physical attractiveness, those relationships tend to last the longest as well. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. I think that dating your looks match is probably the best um one of the most important factors in terms of having a successful relationship but like here's another example so a few days ago i was watching this tiktok of some woman talking about how it was impossible to her for her to find the right guys on tinder and have you seen those charts where it shows um the difference between how men swipe on tinder and women swipe on tinder like women swipe on well, they swipe left on 99% of men. Like the, the data is out there for some women who are like that. Meanwhile, men are swiping on basically every single woman and they're not getting any matches, but the women are getting tons of matches. They're matching with pretty much every guy that they swipe on. But anyway, on this TikTok, this woman who was clearly only swiping on the top five percenters and as an average woman herself, unsurprisingly, she wasn't getting anything back. At best, she would get pumped and dumped from one of these top five percenters. In the comment section, there was this guy who was saying like, oh, you don't know how easy you have it. You don't know how depressing it is as a man to swipe and not get a single match. And then I took one look at his profile. I, I opened up his um, TikTok page and saw his profile picture. And it was unsurprising that he left that comment because he was like yeah. 300 pounds and bald. And he was at least in his uh, late 30s, if not 40s. And as soon as I saw his picture, I was like, well, of course you don't get any matches because that's what you look like. And it's, it's, this is my point, like every single example I see, both in real life and online, it just always ends up pointing back to the black pill. Yeah, because you have a frequency illusion, you have a narrative and you have confirmation bias. That's how all of this looks. You're like, oh, I saw this one example on TikTok and then I looked at a comment. I could, th this guy, I could have him come on here right now. He, you would probably rate him below average and okay, I know some of the women then. he slept with. And I, but I'm not using examples like that because I'm not going, I actually saw a TikTok and then I saw a comment and then I clicked on their profile. Okay, That's explain this then. Because overall trends. Even if you're, if it is even the way you're saying, instead of looking at the extremes, the really overweight, because I agree, those people, especially with online dating, they're going to have a really tough time. What do you think an average guy, how difficult do you think it is for him? Because way hard. He gets no matches on uh, Tinder. No, no, no. In you... real life it is because, because uh, like I said, when you're looking oh, at way no, hard still partners, again. in real life, it's actual so partners, difficult. You don't see BMI having a big effect. You don't even see height having a big effect. You don't see income even having that much of an effect. Poor people, actually poor people even reproduce more and they seem to have the same, almost the same amount of partners as rich people. So people tend to fuck 
uh, no matter what, a lot of people. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some people that struggle more, especially the bottom 300 pound, whatever guy you just talked about. He's going to have a lot harder time, especially if he's relying on online dating that has way less women that not even 50 percent of the population is using. And then he's also doesn't have friends, doesn't go outside, watches your videos. Obviously, he's going to have a problem. But I don't think you can take those people and pretend that all of us are here struggling because the truth is we're not men or women. That's not the case. And in fact, um, I've received so many emails in the last couple of years from guys who have said, we honestly, once I saw your content, once I watched enough of the videos, my dating life completely turned around and I was blue pill for so long. And it's only once I discovered your content, that's when I learned the truth. And I was able to start ramping up the results in my dating Any life. Any content because creator up- email section is going to have, I have emails because I've been debating red pillars. Oh, you changed my mind. Someone like Destiny gets a million of those. He's, what is he, blue pilled? That says, oh, I was red pilled. And then you actually show anybody. You can't look at your own email list. Yes, you've. You, uh, there's going to be people that you've touched. Your content has touched and you're going to have a bunch of emails. My DMs are filled with those too. Almost anybody's DMs are going to be, you, this is what I mean. It's what a selection bias is. Okay, yeah, fair enough. You might say that a lot of other people, you know, um, get those kind of emails as well. But do they have actual receipts, actual results? Because the results that people have sent to me and said how much of an impact my content has had on them, when they previously believed in the content that, like, you know, Destiny and all of these other creators put out, like, which is it? Because only, you know... I'm what, pretty what, sure Destiny I'm, has I'm, people who also say, like, oh, I even do. People are like, oh, I read well, that I'm, book you talked about, and I actually... Or, oh, I followed your advice for talking to this girl, and now we're going on a date next Thursday. And I don't even do the amount of content you do, and I still get messages like that. So we all do. I get messages from people, and people who say the complete opposite of me get messages from people telling them they're right. That's just how the internet works. Yeah, but do these people actually have receipts? That's my point. Because, you know, a lot, I I see it on, I I see these delusional commenters on like some pointless dopamine channels, like who upload video game content and they're like, oh, I don't know what I would do without you, Minecraft YouTuber. Like, you've changed my life. You make me so happy. And, you know, I don't know where I'd be without you. Like, it's it's clear that these people that are leaving these comments I mean, they've sent me pictures of them in their new Pacific and other and been like, okay, yeah, thank you. I'm going to go, like... I, the, the people I, I, that appeared have here to my advice they are sending receipts and they are telling me about how their dating life has actually turned around i will and i will I'm, say this alex, number- alex who's not here with us right now maybe natalia can speak for him he is not he he's not a red pillar he's not even a black pillar and i'm sure he and he does the kind of dating content and help i'm sure he gets a ton of emails and a ton of receipts a ton of screenshots about the things that he's talking about which he thinks confidence and those things are very important and you seem not to i'm sure he has just as many people as you have if not more in his messages who also have receipts that say that his dating or his advice worked for them so again fair enough and yeah that's true because i i don't think that alex playing with fire gives out uh terribly bad advice i think he overplays some things and underplays a little things but a lot of what he says is good if you're an average to above average guy one of the best things you can do to improve your dating life is getting extremely good even slightly photoshopped tinder profiles which make you look like you're a really high value guy that's what i did and i followed the same advice and it worked for me and he has taught that to his clients and he gets results for them as well we don't disagree on as the as much of the solutions as you'd have believed but these guys that are so blue pilled and just don't have a clue what they're talking about or the worst ones are the fine wine copers like richard cooper who tell guys oh just wait until you're 35 bro just make money bro and that's going to be the saving grace like i actually feel sorry for the people that are feeling following his advice because they have no idea that it's going to be 10 times worse for them trying to date if if they wait until that amount of time yeah i agree no guy has yeah, I don't know Sorry, who that on. is, and I, I I disagree with his advice too. I also feel really bad for people watching your content. Like we we just clearly we're living in different realities. That's why I tried to show data, and I've I've told you when you look at I looked at the most researched uh, attraction theories in psychology. I looked at the general trends. I've looked at the latest data we had from 2022 from Pew Research and the GSS. I looked at the amount of partners people have by BMI, height, all of that, and it's not showing what you're showing. And if if you look at your life is much different than mine and the men that are in your email section are much different than the one in mine that are much different than the one in destiny's are much different than the one in alex's so 
I don't know where to go from here if we're just going to be like, well, I know this and my email section says this and someone else says, well, I know that. And, and I on Tinder, like the, exactly you're talking about Tinder, which not even half of the population is on and not even definitely less than half of women are on. And so how are we like... 47% actually have it here said that that was the best way to 45% said that online dating was the best way to meet somebody. And that's how they think. The, and then 33% or uh, yeah, 33% said friends through friends, concert and festivals, 32%. Like people, there's still half of us, if not more that are still going out and have friends and are not sitting on the, in the internet world. Like they go out and touch grass, people who go out and touch grass, this content isn't appealing to them. And I understand that you have an audience of people that your content appeals to. I just think you take that and you generalize to everybody else. And you're like, well, this is what I see. And this is what my email section says. And this is what the two graphs that I'm going to believe, even though I'm not going to believe any of yours say, and I'm going to just be like, oh, people are having, uh, getting married later. And I'm going to make up an explanation that has no backing that is just another reflection of my views and my anecdotes and my beliefs. It just becomes a big confirmation bias echo chamber, which is exactly why I want to, again, just for the audience, critically think. <laughs> mm, I, I understand, you know, what you're saying. Uh, and I'm going to have to say sorry for a second because it cut out halfway through. So uh, um, I didn't hear the whole of your point, but I only heard the start and the tail end of it. Um, but like, I'll, I'll just reiterate, you know, the point, which is that every single time that someone talks to me e either online or in real life like if i have a guy who uh is, is a friend and he's he starts telling me about issues he's facing in his dating life and he would open up his tinder profile and as soon as i see his tinder profile i know if he's getting matches or not and i know if the matches that he is getting are materializing to anything and he would tell me some sob story he'd be like oh it's so difficult man none of these none of these women are uh responding to the messages i'm sending I match with barely anyone. I'm swiping like a hundred times a day and I'd be lucky to get one match. And I look at his Tinder profile, his actual photos, and I look at his face and I look at his posing in the pictures. And I'm like, well, of course, of course. Like, I don't say any of this to his face. And I'm like, not like, okay, well, yeah, because your high body fat percentage, your hairline is receded. Your terrible, your photos are terrible. You're taking mirror selfies. That's why you're getting no matches. I won't say that to anything any of that to him because i'm gonna appear to be empathetic and be like oh that's so hard man yeah dating's online dating so rigged man like you know I'd, I'd make up all of this crap just to make it seem like i'm on, on his side but on the inside i know like oh well, of course of course that's why you're not getting any matches that's cool of course that's why you're not getting any results because that's what you look like and this is what your photos look like yeah. it always points back to black pill Okay, so I actually I'm gonna send this into the chat and I'm if Natalia could put it up where it shows by BMI how many partners you actually have. So you're saying, Oh, I know these guys and my friends and they're telling me they're swiping a hundred times. Yeah, you have interesting. I don't know a thing if if you're sitting around swiping a hundred times a day on Tinder, probably get a life. Like it, it, there are different <laughs> You do things realize going. that would take like less than two minutes to swipe a hundred times. I mean, even just like, that's so a good, you have, I could sit here and be like, I know guys and they don't use dating apps and they're not even attractive and they still get lots of girls. I know guys that use dating apps that aren't very attractive. My best friend, uh, is marrying a guy who she actually did meet on Tinder, who I guarantee you, you would rate like below four, like, and she's, she's not, I would say super attractive either, but it's, it's not this world. And she likes nerdy looking guys. She likes awkward looking guys. She really looks for IQ. She liked one of his prompts. It's not as doom and gloom as you said. And I, if, if Natalia, you can share what I just shared from ResearchGate. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to look into so um, that as well. I'm can also I just, sharing uh, the screen. So like, you would just okay, yeah, that's fair enough. Can I just respond to what you just said there? Cause have you seen either of the two well, I've got three Tinder experiments, but um, two of them are relevant to my point. Have you seen either of the two Tinder experiments? No, but I spent a lot of time in incel forums where they talk about chad fishing and all that. Yeah, of course that stuff works. I'm talking about real life and I'm not talking about my real life. I'm talking about what the data indicates real life is, which is what I'm trying to have her pull up from ResearchGate. Okay, H here's an interesting study in real life, if, if real life is so important. Because one time there was a speed dating experiment where the they, they you know had a bunch of men and women and they all went on speed dates with each other and at the end of the experiment they asked the women uh who they wanted to match with and they asked them why they wanted to match with them and see them again 
And they would say, oh, it's because he had a really good personality. Yeah, I really vibed with him. I had a really good conversation with uh, that particular guy. So I, I can't wait to see him again if he also liked me. And then what they found afterwards is when the women said that, in reality, it was just that the guys were better looking. Fair enough, their personalities might have been decent as well. But what I've seen in real life, in my own experience, is that if you're a Chad, you can just say whatever crap you like. And as long as you're not retarded and you can hold a conversation at least to some degree, then women are going to think that you're hilarious. They're going to laugh at your jokes that aren't even the that The halo funny. effect is like, real. I, I agree well, with you. The yeah, halo exactly. Effect. So, Sorry, so it's guys, just a halo I'm gonna, effect. I'm going to interrupt here because I have one question that I think it's important just for the debate. Can you ask Jasmine if the black pill wasn't real? Why is, is it woman get conf confirmation from other girls if the guy they chase is attractive? If the black pill isn't real, why do women get confirmation from, from other, other girls, girls if the guy, if the guy is they chase is attractive? I mean, well, what woman I didn't say attractiveness doesn't matter at all. Like, but a lot of us are like, oh, do you think he's cute? Like, that's just something. I mean, we all to varying degrees want validation from other people. That's why there's a lot of girls who also look for status and money, even if the guy isn't attractive. So you could go into the beauty parlor and you could be like, I'm fucking Drake or whoever the fuck you want. You know, you people, people do that. That doesn't mean that the I don't see how that means the black pill is real just because people want other people to be to like who they're with or to find the person that they're with to be attractive. It's like a status also thing. Like people on their social media couples. I think it's so cringy where they're like, we're so cute. We're just like a hot couple on social media. People, that's just hum part of human nature. Um, and Something I want to add, I'm sorry. Um, um is that women don't tend to, I, don't, I never done that. Like with my yeah, I've friends. never done that either, to be honest. Never, <laughs> neither do my friends, do my like group of friends ever do that. We do make fun of like, or each other's people. type. You make fun of each yes. other's type. Exactly. Me and my friends, I'm like. <laughs> that's for validation, validation the same way men do. I think that men do it a lot more than women do. Yeah, me and my friends, because we all have like different types, which according to we Fobbles would be, totally objective and I have I like I have a type and my best friends have a type and like we always joke about like I'll find a guy and I'm like I think this guy's so hot and I send it to her because I know she's gonna think he's ugly and it's gonna be vice versa so yeah I would love to pull up the the research gate um thing I just set and you can see like again what actually goes on when it comes to different the, the mean number of, first of all, even here, the mean number of partners for people, it varies from like 12 at the highest. Like there's this idea that there are these, like, it's very, very rare. Those would be outliers that are having sex with hundreds and hundreds of people because they're getting all these swipes on Tinder. Um, you can see even height, very short, has an average 9.4 partners, very tall, extremely tall, has the mean is 12.3 partners. So th and then all the ones in the middle, it's like 11 for short and very tall, 12. That's one on average partner. And the difference okay. between the very short and the very tall is three. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, in, in this data, it does show correlations with the black pill, first and foremost. I would expect them to be more exaggerated th than they are. But first point is that they do show correlations with the black pill. So very short guys have the least partners. Extremely tall guys have the most. By Obese three. And then if the you less. look at it short to average to tall to very tall, it's less than one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I understand that. So, you know, the, the correlation still aligns with the black pill, but I'm just surprised it's not stronger. But there's so many missing variables and data points here. It doesn't talk about so many different things. Like, what about the quality of the women? Like, how do you know that that very short guy who's got 9.4 bodies, how do you know that he wasn't just going for, like, some, you know, he wasn't dumpster diving and going for it's the three out of It's not one guy, women? though. It's not one guy. The sample size isn't one very short guy and one very Okay, I'll tall. tell you what I've seen. So, the if, if there's a woman who's, like, a three out of ten, and then, um, you know, someone will tell me that, oh, you do realize so-and-so who's a three out of 10 has a boyfriend. I'll be like, oh, wow, that's crazy because, uh, you know, it was a little bit surprising that she's a three out of 10 and a, the, the, she's got a boyfriend. And then I find out what the boyfriend looks like and he would also be like a three or a four and it's some like obese guy. You know, isn't that what we just quality... talked about? That people tend to go across, and that's okay. So first, yeah, but even then, he would be marginally better. He'd be marginally but... higher SMV, but he's no Chad. So yeah, but... you know, this correlates to the uh, 
You if you're if your argument Stacey is that we are all with Chad's and we are all with Stacy's, of course not. And I think that's another critique of this is where it yes, if you're if you're not a super attractive, super charismatic, then you if you're looking at top Instagram models and you're like, I can't get those girls, I can't get Kim Kardashian, Margot Robbie is mid, da 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 da. Like those kind of people, I'm like, okay, yeah, you just spend all your time at the internet looking at people, looking at faces, and you're not you should be going for people in your around your level of attractiveness. You agreed with that. So yeah, I agree. The very short guys are probably not fucking Megan Fox, but is that, is, is, should we all be fucking Megan Fox? I mean, I do well, think there's saying, little... No, but this data, what I'm saying, the main thing it misses out is that the quality that these short or obese guys are able to obtain, I guarantee you, is far less than what the in shape or very tall guys are I agree with you because that, that, to... that coincides with assortative mating that people are generally mating across so if you're not if you're overweight then maybe the, I think there's a higher likelihood you're also fucking overweight people so now this criteria has changed from no women to women in your league if you're saying that most people get women in their league or men in their league I would agree with you and also this is not one person this is what the mean you can see the median you can see all of that and you can see even uh mid healthy weight versus obese versus upper weight. You're seeing that these are like one to two on average, more partners or less partners. And yeah, I agree with you. If you look at the, the, the pool of women that the ugly short guy is fucking versus the Chad, they're going to look differently, but of course, and, and I, I am totally for the message. So, that if you're that's still a black pill then at the end of the day, because, you know, we, we could argue over the fact like, oh, are they having less or is the quality less? you know, which is it, irrespective, it still points to black pill. Because if the guys who are lower SMV, aka who are short, have worse faces, who are obese, if they're getting worse quality or just less women, at the end of the day, the conclusion is the same. It points to the black pill that looks or oh, what is driving home what each of the guys is able to obtain. Well, okay, first of all, I, that this data isn't unequivocally showing that. But also my point is that you're saying that like all these women are, go so then we would expect the tall people to have more than just one more partner than, because you're saying even the average women and all these women are going for the top, but the data doesn't indicate that if black pill solely means that how you look is going to indicate how good your partner looks, then sure. I'm all for the black pill, but that's not the message I was hearing earlier. Okay. So do you know how what what equivalent the top one percent of uh, men on Tinder get compared to the bottom XX percent? Again, men? I know you love Tinder. That's why I'm looking at real data, not Tinder swipes. Because the, uh, we can also pull up the 2022 study that I showed you. Because what swipes do not indicate dates and sex. I've sw I don't I've swiped on people. I've never had sex with a single person I swiped on. So it's it's not a uh, oh here's what people are doing on the internet when they have no choice but to rate people based on superficial factors. And then you go into the real world and you see oh in the real world women are dating men that are less than six feet tall. And actually those men are having sex with roughly the same amount of women as people who are over six feet tall. Oh fat men are having sex with roughly the same amount of people. And then you go. Well, no, they're not, they're just not going to be as hot. Okay, sure. But you're not seeing this thing of the top, the tallest or the most fit men having sex with a enormous amount of women. And then men who are average or below average or kind of short or whatever are not having sex. You're not seeing that. So okay. who cares what people are doing on their phones? Again, I would implore you, less than half of us are even on these apps. Way less women are on these apps. Instead of sitting there swiping on 100 profiles a day, trying to find one to match with you, that probably isn't even going to meet up with you in the first place because most of us don't. And uh, go, go out, have friends, get hobbies, touch grass. Which did we lose you? Wait. Hello? Hello? Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. You're back. Did, did you hear? Uh, no, we didn't hear the la anything you said after what okay. I said. Um, yeah, well, I, I heard like um, most of what you said, but I think um, I, I pretty much already iterated what I had to say anyway. I was just going to go back and like, it, it seems that we have been going a little bit circular um, for the last, you know, half an hour, whatever, because, you know, you've been saying a lot of the same points. And the point I was just about to address there to respond to what you said, I realized that I had already talked about it previously because, 
you like to talk about how you know online isn't the be all and end all and you know it seems that you agree that the black pill is absolutely true on online dating apps because on you know when i talk about tinder and things like that you're like your your, your go-to response will be oh uh yeah but that's just tinder if you look at the real world you'll see that guys who aren't in this top 10 percent of chads are actually getting some and you know there's disputes over the quality of what these guys are able to obtain however you know it seems that you just don't want to talk about uh, online even though it is well, it's not that i don't want to talk about online because i do think though that it's important because you can look at yeah if we're just looking at swiping on tinder then maybe what you're saying is true but i'm actually looking at uh, I, I would implore and what my goal is to get people off of the online world and see what's happening in real life because the 80 20 rule is happening on tinder but it's not happening in real life so what are if you're a guy who's swiping on tinder and you're not getting any match most women aren't even on tinder and then you go out and look at research gate or you look at all these these things that i've showed and i'm and and then you're wondering well that's weird how come in real world they're not getting them all the women how come in the real world average men are having just as much sex as men that are tall then you're going to be like oh shit, maybe I should not look at this and think that this is reflective of reality. This is reflective of this app. So I right. agree with Here's you. another point. So when it comes to that data you showed about um, obese people getting almost as many bodies as uh, guys who are in shape, was age factored into the equation at all? Because generally speaking- is. Do you Sorry. Reference, the reference category column for each variable? For example, I have a reference category for the first column. Because how do you think... know that there's not a third variable that's influencing this data? Because generally speaking, most the vast majority of young people are in good shape. And I think the obesity rate of 18 to 29-year-olds amongst men is only like 5% or 10%. Well, I mean, we can Barely look at the age, criteria, but research gate, research gate is pretty, they, their stat, uh, statisticians are pretty good and they're not going to be comparing like people that are of completely different ages or anything. That's why you can see well, all, do you I don't know, know, I'm not sure what all those for that one. Because I think that that would be a reasonable explanation for why it comes up. How do you know that? So you're the, okay. Well, let me. I could. I could look at it. I could download it and well, look at could, it. Yeah. I'm going to have to log my point into is, my. Is, my point is, is how do you know that the obese men who have like eight, nine bodies, whatever, that they weren't in good shape when they were younger, and then they were able to get no. They're looking results, at a specific and now they're like time in their period. Or, they're looking at a specific time period. They're not looking at oh. Uh, in life or back when you were this or back when you were that also most people tend their bmis tend to until they get older which they wouldn't be comparing like a huge age range they, they it tends to be around the same that's just what the science is on bmi in general not saying that you don't have those stories like i said there are billions of people in the world be like well i know a guy who used to be fat and now he's i know a person that used to be skinny enough but generally people who are like an obese three weren't underweight in general, we're not seeing like a ton of that. So you can look at this data and be like, what about maybe this? What about that? This data is not only from ResearchGate. You can find it on other, um, other. I think Pew did something similar um, and it shows the same thing. So it, if this data is correct, I just want to know, would it change your mind or no? No, it wouldn't up, uh, okay. at all. Because okay. I, like when, when I see some obese guy who you know, who, who, who's trying to pick up women or something like this, or, you know, he's on Tinder. I know that he's not going to get any results. I know that it's it's impossible for him. God knows how this data has even, like, come, come to surface and where they've got these numbers from. It seems that the obese people that have answered in this survey, they've, they've pulled their body count out of their ass. And, mm. you know, you don't know what's been happening. Because okay, so I think we can leave it. Let me ask you, do you find obese guys attractive? Do you find very short guys? I don't guys find obese guys attractive, but obese guys, well, well, like, guy I agree. Easy. But I also, I, I, I actually like guys. I don't prefer guys that are six foot and over. I actually prefer guys that are intelligent. A lot of the guys yeah, I've dated, I are probably been. under, out of, like I'm probably more attractive than them. So if we're looking at just me and I told you my issue with dating apps is that I'll swipe on the most attractive people too, but I won't hang out with them. And then I get off the app because I'm like, this is kind of stupid because hey, I have nothing to go off of. Guy that you've been with. Huh? Five what's foot six. Five foot six. And what's the tallest? Six foot four. Okay, but and not the average. do you have any indication of what the average is? Probably five eight, five nine. Okay, that's a little. And bit I'm, more. and I'm, and I, I mean, I'm. 
the the tallest guy that you went with, he's mm-hmm. six inches above the average height for men. And the shortest guy you went with was only four inches below the average height for men. So you'd go out with the six foot four guy, but not the five foot four guy. Is it's well, blatantly the, yeah, I mean, blatantly I, as well that women care about height. The taller you I'm are, not the saying they don't care is. about height, but you don't see it actually replic in real life. And I'm somebody oh, I mean, I've I've always been considered sexually attractive. I have really I'm a top point zero one OnlyFans creator. I could have I can have my pick of guys, and I still in general have only dated one guy that was that tall. All the other guys have been under six feet, and I could date all the six foot plus tall guys that I want. But there are other things that I'm looking for other than their jaw lines and their <sighs> ratios and their heights and so if you just want to say oh these these numbers were pulled out of people's ass but my chart is reflective and my experience shows this and my email section shows this i think we can leave the debate there and just get to uh super chats because i don't think it's worth it to just go in circles and have you once people start saying oh i the data's fake i i just start it just starts becoming kind of dumb. But if you want to ask about me and my personal experience, yeah, I I have always been considered super attractive in all the spheres I've been in. And I've had men that are six foot six, six foot five, six foot four, whatever. All of them want to date me. And I've always kind of preferred a little bit shorter guys that were smarter and funnier. Funny to me is number one. And maybe Natalia can speak on her experience to me. But if a guy can make me laugh, I would much rather have that than someone who has a sharper jawline. Mm. Well, I I don't have any evidence to back up the point that I'm about to say, but I've seen it anecdotally so many times that when a guy is attractive, then women will automatically assume that he is funnier. If a guy is tall and good looking, then the guy's jokes automatically become funny. But if it was some sub five or some short guy hitting on her, making these kind of jokes, then the woman's not going to laugh at it. She's going to find the jokes creepy or weird. Like I've, I've seen this so many times in a sexual sense as well. Whenever a attractive guy makes sexual innuendos on, um, you know, to, to try to like seduce the woman, if an attractive guy does it, it's always received well. But if a sub five or unattractive guy tries to do it, then it, becomes creepy or uncalled for or out of line or weird so there like, is i don't have any evidence effect. to back this up no you do have evidence you do it's called the halo effect which is real but that's not like i said the problem with what you guys use you take something with a grain of truth and you take it to a conclusion that is not backed up by the evidence right the way logic works is premise premise conclusion and the premise has to logically follow I and mean, the conclusion has to logically follow from the premise these are just the rules of logic and then there's a scientific method these are how this is the best level of analysis and data we can have and that doesn't coincide with that on a one-to-one of like oh he's hot therefore people think he's more funny there's been a lot of really hot guys i've gone out with like on a date or something and i didn't find their jokes that funny and there are guys that when i first met them i was like "Uh," and then they really that's what proximity proximity mere exposure effect big other thing in uh, psychology which is why if you go to school with a guy or you go to work with a guy and you see him day after day after day after day he becomes more attractive to you that's also a a part of um the psychological research that we have okay i I disagree and you know uh, if, if i end up responding to what you've just said there i'd only be repeating myself so Okay. I'm more happy to move on to a different point or whatever because um, I don't want this being circular. Okay. We can get, I don't know what uh, Natalia wants to go to next. Then. Um, You mentioned with waffles, you mentioned something about hypergamy. Yeah. About Pete Davison. Like when we gave the example, when someone in the chat mentioned that, you know, like he's not a very attractive guy and uh and he gets very successful, attractive women more so than him. So can you expand about where do you guys stand when it comes to hypergamy? Do you think it is a thing? And what do you consider hypergamy? Whether you consider... Right. Hyper- okay, let, let's address Pete Davidson. He's either 6'3 or 6'4. He's not horrendously attractive. Fair enough, he's not a Chad. But he's not a sub-5 either. He's either a normie or a high-tier normie. Or if a woman's got a niche preference, maybe a seven. So that can explain that. And he's also a a celebrity. He's got loads of money. He's got status. He's got a million Instagram followers. That's the hypergamy there. So, you know, maybe it's not 
directly in, in looks. Wait, isn't with, hypergamy though more than the woman? Because he's dating other women who have more. So he's not, they're not dating up in status. Kim Kardashian wasn't dating up in status. Ariana Grande wasn't dating up in status or Instagram followers. So how is that hypergamy? Well, because it's still dating, you know, people in the same realm of status. Like, you know, right. it, it gets to a point where if a woman is so high status herself, you know, she often needs to like maybe date down a tiny bit, but she's not going to be dating the uh, homeless guy or the guy who's working at McDonald's. Like, look at, um, you know, who's that American footballer who is dating Taylor Swift now? Like, she's probably one of the most famous people on the planet at the moment. And she would probably sell more tickets if she did a stadium tour herself than this guy playing for his whole NFL team. So if, if you're that high status, it's going to be hard to reach hypergamy for because there's there's just not the options of guys who would match your level of status. However, they're still in the same ballpark. Like, you know, they're both celebrities still at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. People, t celebrities tend to date other celebrities, lawyers date other lawyers, people tend to date across, like, like you said, streamers, people in this online world, they tend to date each other. We all tend to date people in our world, in our sphere. Um, my opinion on hypergamy, it's weird because I think the red pillars do it differently where they think women date up in like status and wealth, but not in looks. Um, and oftentimes actually men are, are selecting for looks and women are selecting. So that's what they think. Hypergamy, at least when it comes to education and income has been on the decline since women have been able to enter the workforce. This is shown. There's like a really famous hypergamy graph done where you could see as women started becoming more and more educated. They were more okay with men who were uh, less educated or than before. Even historically speaking, women's husbands seem to match the same status as their dads. People, again, tended to even in those times marry in the same like group. Even my parents who immigrated from the Middle East, like it was like, oh, he's a good family. We're a good family. Educated, educated. Okay, this is how we typically uh, date and meet. So I, I don't think there's even been strong examples of hypergamy even historically, okay. but certainly today it's been evolution for a second. Why are men taller than women? Hmm? Why are men taller than women? I'm not one of those people who says there's no differences in men and women. I don't oh, know the exact evolutionary reason for that, but Why probably... Would... Huh? Well, could you think of a evolutionary reason for why men are taller than women? Because historically speaking, men were the protectors and the stronger gender in order to gather the resources and women were the ones delivering babies and doing more of the nurturing. Okay, so th there might be some survival elements with regards to it. However, I also think that there'll be a sele sexual selection aspect, which is that women selected the guys who were taller and the guys who were the same height as the women were less likely to be you know able to reproduce and when you factor in the fact that pretty much every single woman reproduced historically but only 40 percent of the men did then you know it's a lot more cutthroat as a man trying to uh, be, be selected for in order to re reproduce and there's also evidence to suggest that in species that the more similar the male and females are in any given species, then the more monogamous they are and sexual like less, dimorphism. Yeah, the, the less the less uh, sexual dimorphic they are, and yeah, it so correlates with them. It, yeah. it correlates with like a more fair and balanced dating market in those selective species. So there's not just one Chad who's monopolizing and spreading his seed amongst like ten different women. And when you look mm -hmm. at humans men and women are pretty different in terms of appearance men are significantly stronger men are taller men you know have very different facial structures to women so that implies that there is a high degree of sexual selection going on that men have evolved to have these characteristics in order to be more dominant and seen, seen as more attractive in front of women it's, it's satisfying their hypergamy no, that's, that's, that, that's definitely true. But hypergamy. So for instance, you always see like older men, sometimes, especially older, attractive men going for young, fertile women that you could say it's hypergamy because she's dating up in status and whatever. But you could also say, if you're looking at hypergamy from the attractiveness metric, he's dating up because she's younger, she's more fertile, whatever. I actually know a lot about this. So our closest cousins are chimps and gorillas. And one sexual dimorphism is one thing. You can also look at testicle size. So chimps engage in sperm competition, which we also did for a long 
long time too. Some evolutionary biologists theorize even that's why the penis is shaped the way it is to like scoop out the sperm of other uh, men. And then gorillas, you see on the other side, they have small testicles. They don't engage in sperm competition. There's one, the alpha and he gets, and we're in the middle kind of. And the most sec, the most, uh, the most successful sexual reproduction strategy we've, we typically have. And again, this is not cut in stone. Evolutionary biologists, dis- like there's competing theories. It's not, it's a lot of evolutionary biology is top down reasoning. We see something and we try to like guess why it is the way it is. It's not concrete as, as concrete as some other sciences is serious monogamy as opposed to the chad who is having sex with all these women like that's why the beta bucks alpha that doesn't have um any uh, really any backing which is why even the the evolutionary biologists who first theorized it have have it said okay actually i'm changing my mind i haven't found evidence for this so yeah it it, it is a com- mate selection is this complex nuanced thing and yeah uh, there probably are certain features that have been evolved in us to be more attractive on both ways to the others, to the other gender. I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying that that's not the whole picture and looking at things really black and white is, is not, is not borne out by what we actually see when we look at research outside of our little internet sphere. Because obviously, if that's the case, if I just went based off what I see, I don't see any of the shit you're talking about. So I would say it's not real then, but I know it's real. I just am looking at what percentage of people it's real from by looking at this data and looking at what's actually happening in the real world, looking at if the Pareto principle is actually there. What happens when we flip it? What percentage of men? 20% of men are also sleeping with 80% of the, uh, I mean, 20% of uh, men, women are sleeping with 80% of the men too. Okay. Well, that's kind of weird. So looking at all that and trying to decipher what's actually going on in the online dating world and to see that there are no super clear cut looks is all of this. And this is what people were always selecting for. And they're not selecting for this. And they're only looking at this and your jaw structure is so like, you know, we, I think we've gone back and forth with this. Um, as much okay, in- well, I want to address one point that you talked about. So if you said that, you know, humans like have been theorized by the evolutionary biologists to have been serial monogamous. And that implies to me that the, you got like the top caliber men who are essentially spinning plates, you know, all, all of these millenniums ago. No. And well, explain why 40% of men reproduce. Well, historically. I mean, one of the but reasons for that is eight- also- yeah. So one of the well, yeah, reasons because, because the charts were spinning plates and no, no, no. <laughs> uh, historians and other evolution biologists have also said if you actually read more than just the headline that confirms your narrative is that men were going off into war and they were staying in the same families too, whereas women were being married off into different families. So their genes were reproducing because they're spread out and they're not dying, whereas men, entire families of men, were being slaughtered together in the same village because women like if you had five daughters you would send each daughter off to live with a male family that's different whereas all five brothers are either all going to war together or they're staying in the same land and they're all getting killed when they get attacked that's one of the reasons for that okay i don't think that men were dying like at twice the rate of women and that's the reason why well, 40% gene, of men the way reproduced. gene reproduction There's works definitely going to be some sexual well, because you look at the way that men and women evolve like men are so much more competitive when it comes to um mate selection than it is for women like that's women true, that's... okay when, when you look at you know men who try to spin plates or try to serial monogamize the point is it's only men who do that when I see a man who, you know, potentially already has a relationship or has a woman who he's dating at the moment, then he also, you know, tries to get more. He's, he's like, oh, this is quite good. But now let me try to add another plate, uh, you know, to, to the woman that I'm already dating at the moment. You don't see women doing that. Well, the there women are who already between... have a relationship with a guy yeah. that they desire, they're just content to stay with him. There Only are men differences between place. men and women, but if you know anything about evolutionary biology, even if you've read basic shit like the selfish gene, you know that how evolutionary biology works is we're all, it's like a game between men and women. So men act one way and then there's the ESS, the evolutionary stable, what is it, where, where it eventually stables out. That's kind of why we have the distribution we have of men and women. And it works in different species too. Even with ch- child rearing, the reason the women typically stay and the men go is because they can, because the, bo- the woman as the one that has to carry the child so the men can go but then we as time went on and our brains got bigger and it took two parents to rear that's when this whole idea of pair bonding came in if you look at fish on the other hand because it's not working like that women are actually the ones because they're able to dip and the guy is the one that stays home and takes and or stays home or takes care of the kids so how evolution but evolutionary biology works is we're 
all trying to do this re gene reproduction thing, but serial monogamy tends right now with how big our brains are and how it does typically take two children, I mean, two parents to rear, uh, to bring up a child and the child has the best chance of survival with that is how we get relationships and, and how monogamy and all that has, has come about. But that doesn't mean it's a hundred percent. It would have the, it would have the highest chance of, um, raising a child successfully with two parents but what stops you know potentially other mating strategies being involved which can be beneficial for both a woman and a man so it if, doesn't but that's if a man, if a man listen to my point so if a man he is a top 10 percent guy and he's really sought after by women and women are sexually available to him and he can reproduce with those women and he can impregnate these those, those he can impregnate those women and then all of that woman if she's already in a relationship with a guy now she's got the best of both worlds now she's got a you know man's high value genetics from a top 10 percenter and she's also got the beta provider who she occasionally sleeps with during her non-ovulating phase and there's evidence to back this up as well, which is the no, there is. Humans... That's why David Bust went back on that because alpha fucks, beta bucks actually didn't have enough evidence. Well, why, and why, why do people... why do women conceal their ovulation? What do you mean? Why do women conceal their ovulation? Why do we as a species do that? Well, one of the reasons for that is actually because because of the monogamy and the pair bonding and wanting to have a relationship with two people, since sex can can bring intimacy, we actually have sex outside of the periods of ovulation. Whereas like, if you look at lions that don't have that, when the woman's in heat, she, they fuck. And then they don't have any relationship beyond that. There's no like actual relationship or pair bounding happening in those species. Whereas in like our species that does have that, we have sex outside of the times that we're just supposed to be ovulating. Okay. Um, one of the theory states. And, that... and also the other point you made is the dominant theory, the do what's happening dominantly, how genes work is the dominant one is actually usually the most successful. So this top, whatever percent of men who's able to do this, women aren't selecting for that. Women are selecting for security, all of those things over than the big, bad alpha genes, which is why that theory has not been proven. And even the same, like well, David you, Buzz you can't, has you been can't like, prove yeah, any of these theories realistically, but you know, I've not there heard hasn't the theory been, you said about. Not the, that. Theory that not I've, the theory that I've heard is that women can seal their ovulation in humans and not in other species because it means that during the time that a woman is ovulating, she can sleep with the top percentile man, you know, be behind her beta uh, boyfriend's back. And in, in the other, like, three weeks of the month, she'll sleep with the beta guy and make him think that he is getting her pregnant but in reality uh she's pregnant with the top 10 percent of genes from the time that she was ovulating and if you look at uh, another related study which said how when a woman is in her ovulating stage she is more likely to seek out um strong masculine characteristics in a partner which correlate with stronger genes but yeah. during for three weeks of her cycle she so, is seeking for the beta qualities such as providership so again that's why this was a theory and then there wasn't any evidence for it because even though women were doing that they weren't actually they weren't actually stepping out and cheating on what their their things and when you look at this the amount of children that were born to somebody that wasn't like the cheating and with the alpha guy and getting those genes was so 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 slim across all all cultures, it it only tended to be more likely in very poor places. And even that was like under whatever percent. And something that a lot of this community does, like they go 10% of paternity. No, that's 10% of cases where paternity is questioned. It's a very, very small percentage of people that have these babies or actually get the alpha genes and then have somebody else raise the baby, which is why this theory is no longer an accepted theory in evolutionary biology. And I would implore the audience, if you guys are curious about it, look up how much data there is to back beta uh, bucks, alpha alpha fox and you'll see that there's a reason that they have said that this is not what most of us believe anymore including the people who originally uh promulgated it well at the end of the day we don't necessarily know we we don't know and you know this is just one element of the alpha fox beta box theory but i say the strongest case of alpha fox beta box is that if you look at women's dating strategies now or the way that a lot of women live out their dating lives during their late teens and early 20s their prime years it's all 
oh, you know, download Tinder, let's go to nightclubs, let's sleep with the top 10% of chads, the guys who are really tall and good looking. And they will, you know, freely give those really attractive guys, um, you know, the opportunity to sleep with them in the meantime. And it's only when these women then reach their 30s, and even the red pillars agree with this, who are supposed to be in contention. They say that, oh, when women are in their 30s, they're not going to be looking as much at the uh, Chad guy who's dumb and you know hasn't got any long-term prospects. They're going to be looking at you, who's actually worked on himself and built up some assets and some wealth. That's proving the black pills theory. Ironically, well, it's the not proving red the black theory, theory on this. It's and, the red, and the black pill theory the same. So even people well, like Peterson, who I'm not a fan of, have talked about this, like how when you're younger and your prefrontal cortex isn't developed, you mistake certain qualities like the bad boy, whatever, with masculinity, with this narrative narrow, distorted view of masculinity. Once your brain develops, you're like, actually bad boys aren't hot anymore. So it's, it's, it's with younger people, they tend to party more. They it's, although all that is going down and you can look at the stats on how many women, uh, how many men women actually sleep with. And it seems like after 35, you do really see that the vast majority of people are having sex in relationships with one person. They're kind of not doing that part. So I don't think the party phase really proves the black pill. I haven't seen anything that you've said that has proved the black pill, but again, I think we're just going in circles. So I'm down to just go into super chats. Um, a lot of, again, this stuff is speculative. A lot of the stuff you say is speculative, but then, so there's always something that like you can say, oh, okay, this, there's correlation, causation, all of that. But then a lot of the stuff you say, I think the competing theories also with the data we have to back up show that your speculations are not the strongest, um, the strongest ones that we should have for why things are the way they are, but agree to disagree. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to go to the Super Chats in a second, but I only had one more point to make on, um, you know, in response to what you just said, which is that, you know, you'd say that, like, there's no evidence to support women are going through all of these party phases. Well, yeah, that's just what they say. Because when you look at the data and the same chart that I brought up earlier, which is that two thirds of men say they are single, but only one third of women do, that's because the women are plates to the chads. And then when they're asked in these surve surveys, are you single? Of course they're going to say no. Of course they're going to say, oh no, I'm sleeping with Chad, but no, we we're in a relationship. Or no, we're almost in a relationship. So that's what they're going to say in the survey. But the Chad, he just, has she left? Has she disappeared? Oh, I, I think it, it may have dropped. Oh, okay. Let's just... Well, I, I think I, you know, said my point. Um, you yeah, know, let's just wait to for agree that most Chad, people back. I can't see her webcam Jeff, or anything. I cannot see you or hear you. Would you want to jump to the super chats then, whatever, if, um, you know, yeah, she's not... Yeah, let's jump to the super chats. Um, so we will... I'm hiding, uh, I'm hiding her back. Sorry, um, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm good now. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Just, well, I think you heard the majority of my point. I heard part of it, and... and uh, he, he, I think you're just saying that she, but, but okay. Yeah. So my point was what I was going to say to that before this whole, the whole thing disconnected was that, but it, when you see even eighth, the 18 through 24, what the women are doing, you don't see a large percentage of men sleeping around this hookup culture myth. They, they, they are, but they just don't know that they are. Cause this is how but no, I'm right. looking at number right. of partners. They don't know how many men they've slept with. You're saying that they all are sleep, think that they're sleeping with, they're all sleeping with this one chat, but then you don't see men that have a high body, these high body counts either. Right. It's not is. borne out by the data. You don't see men that are sleep, sleeping with a bunch of women. You don't see men, women that are sleeping with one man who thinks that they're in a relationship with them. Um, the looking at 18 to, through 29 for both genders is not a great way to, to determine who and why they, things are the way they are. I'd be so interested at looking at women 18 to 29 and looking at men maybe 20 through 30, whatever, a little bit, a couple years older to actually match what happens in the real world. So I, I think this is just a great indication of you taking like a graph and then running with your narrative and using that as something that uh, well, it's, it's, it's not only like, you know, running with my narrative, but it's what I've seen in the real world as well. The women and that, you've seen. Yeah. And I've seen the opposite. So now what? Line. You see, like women say like, oh, you know, I was getting with this guy and then all of a sudden he disappeared. Yeah, that's because you were a plate, but you still slept with him. Men say that too. Yeah. Well, Men women get also get annoying, 
<laughs> no, women get ghosted way more than men because they don't know that they're just a plate to some. Uh, See, like if I was you, I would be like, up. I ghost men way more. I've never been ghosted, and I've ghosted a lot of men. So the, uh, there we go. It's different than what you're saying. So th this if maybe you're an exception, but if you look up on any like Reddit post saying like, oh, I keep getting ghosted, oh Reddit, yeah, pinnacle of science. <laughs> But there's going to be way more people. To, well, you know, this is this is obvious. More, more women uh. talk about being ghosted than men. Men talk about getting flaked on because most women don't sh show up to dates. But once a man and the woman is actually like, you know, in a semi relationship, so they're like in the first stages of dating, the man is way more likely to disappear off the face of the earth than the woman is. Especially Again, once they started sleeping to, with you, each other. If, if it's obvious, then we don't need to talk about it more. If people want to go by Reddit threads, and Reddit is even something that I don't think would have a good reflection. The sample size or the wouldn't be reflective because a lot more men are on it than women are. It's like a kind of nerdier place to be. There's a lot of issues with getting your information from Reddit yeah, or from it's your, it's your, your it's social it's circle it's and it's your it's email it's inbox or your comment section in the red pill world or the black pill world. Again, I think again we're going in circles. If you have any other questions or any other points, but I feel well, like I think that we are going. In I'm sorry if to you want to make common sense, if, if if you wanted to make common sense, I'm more than happy to. If you look at the dating coaches, well, I don't, I don't like, like to look at your common sense based, based on your experiences, and then when right. I show you research, you say they're all lying or that they probably weren't getting the research accurately or blah blah blah. To me, I feel like we've we've ran around circles with this. If you have a new thing to bring up, okay, I do um, have a new thing to bring up. I was just about to bring it up before you interrupted me. Have you heard of the dating coach Matthew Hussey on YouTube? I've seen maybe like a clip of him. Okay, I've seen a few of his videos as well, and he often asks questions from women who he he coaches, and the the all the questions always seem to follow the same sort of themes. And it's a woman who's complaining. They're like, "Oh, I was dating this guy, but then he disappeared and he ghosted me." These are the kind of questions that women are asking. Because what yeah, but it this simply is, what is, is that they're stop, stop interrupting me. Stop interrupting me. She, she's been led on by a plate. And and then the Chad or the guy who's above her SMV by several points just discards her. It's, it's obvious when you break it down okay. in this way. And, okay. as for, and as for men's dating channels, what are the main themes that men are asking? They're asking, why am I not getting any matches? Why am I getting flaked on? And it's always coming back to the black pill again because they're not attractive enough. Okay, I'm going to say one thing and then I think Natalia also asked us to go to closing statements. So, of course, if you're looking at a dating channel and the women that are writing in, the women that are writing in are going to be the ones that are experiencing issues, which is why they're writing into a dating uh, show. Just like the men who watch Fresh and Fit are going to be far more likely to have interest, uh, if problems with women. The men who watch your channel are going to have far, are far more likely to have issues with women than regular men or the chat. So that's what a selection bias is. And that's why I was trying to look at what Pew Research and actual research gate when they're looking at general population, not just the people calling into a dating show with the problems they have about dating. Of course, it's going to say that. And so uh, Natalia just chatted that we're going to closing statements soon. So I'm down to go to that. We've been doing this for two hours and I feel like we Perfect. Um, before that, um, we're going to go to Super Chats. So, Indian P, can you please post the Super Chats on screen? I think there's one on the screen now. There's just one. Would you Would you date? Just want to know if J Jasmine would date that guy. I don't know which guy he means. Like waffles? Uh, never in a million years, but I think it's <laughs> obvious. <laughs> Oh, like I would an OnlyFans. Stuff. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, I think it's 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 mutual. Um, okay, another one. Can you please, Indian P, post the next one? Um, this guy says that he went from a two to um, out of ten to an eight out of ten with a great body, even modeled. I asked my crush out. She rejected me for an uglier and shorter brown guy than me. How do you explain the advantage that brown blacks have? I watched one of Wheat Waffle's videos and he said white guys actually had an advantage. So I'm curious what his response here is because he likes to pick one example of things he's seen and run with it. So what would you explain for this? Yeah, I would say that white guys tend to have an easier time dating and they tend to get the most matches as well. Okay, so apparently he thinks that that was just random. What happened to you? Okay, perfect. And we have another one. MP, please. 
Um, debate me with waffles. You need an anthropologist with perspective so you can learn a dose of reality. I am cultural anthropologist scholar and can school you on the way things really are in society. If he wants to arrange the debate, more than happy. Okay, perfect. Um, TCPS, please send an email to Alex. And um, Inyampi will write it in the comment section because I don't know his email. <laughs> and um, we can just move forward to closing statements. Okay. I, I don't care who goes first. Um, you can go first. I don't particularly mind. I, I don't. I don't even think that a uh, closing statement for me. Is I think our closing like, statements would be the same the as our opening closing, statement. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is the point of a closing statement? Like, how formal is this debate? You know, surely we've just like been debating the topics, and I think we like, could just do a basic... purpose of a closing statement. I guess we could reiterate our points, but I agree with you in that everyone who's been listening probably like my closing statement would be similar to my opening statement that I think I've gone through and explained why a lot of the stuff that he talks about is not representative of how dating works in the real world. I've showed data. I've showed research. Um, I've talked about some of the fallacies he's using um, in selection bias and using a lot of anecdotes to prove his point. And I think that I'm happy with the way this went. And I think the audience can make their decision. Um, I'd agree with the last point. I think that a lot of my anecdotes are grounded in reality and I just wish I had more of the data on hand. I wasn't hundred percent sure on what topic was even in the debate, uh, before this debate came around. So if I knew what kind of topics came up, I would have definitely brought more data with regard to height and men's attractiveness. And I don't think that tinder or any online dating can be as overlooked as you were making out throughout the debate the fact that the top one percent of chads get as many matches at the bottom as the bottom 80 percent of uh, men combined just shows how important looks are in today's dating age especially when you look at how prevalent online dating is perfect thank you so much guys um would you like to plug your channels or specific projects, Instagrams, etc. Sure. So um, you can go to Jasmine Jafar, J-A-Z-M-E-N-J-A-F-A-R dot M-E. And you can see my OnlyFans, if that's your cup of tea or my Instagram. I also am, have a YouTube channel now and I'm really actually trying to push out content. So if you guys want to interested in my content, you can check me out on YouTube and Instagram is a good place to go to see any kind of stuff like this I do, other debates, appearances, etc. Perfect. Um, wheat waffles? Uh, just wheat waffles on YouTube. And, you know, I'm sure most of the people watching already know who I am. I've been on a few dates, debates on this channel before. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, guys. We um, have another debate at eight with the Crucible. Um, I think, let me just check it out. The scheduling um, The Crucible, Michael Sertain, Love, and Tom Fullery. So we'll see you there at eight. Bye. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wheat Waffles. Yeah, thank you for the debate and thank you for